Hello, game design. It is your instructor, Nicholas O'Brien. I am going to walk through using the Unity Nav Mesh to create, uh, or to modify, I should say, the NPC that we had created to have them behave more like an enemy that follows you when you get within a certain radius. Um, now, obviously, I haven't programmed any kind of like combat or anything like that. I'm going to leave that up to you and add some additional resources uh, in the discussion notes for this uh, course that uh, can help you along the way if you want to implement that. But I wanted to kind of complete this thought at least about how we could implement um, some AI here that could follow you, right? when you reached a certain radius. Um, you'll also note that I reconfigured the player uh, capsule, uh, not from the first person camera capsule that we had been working with before, um, but instead now I'm using a kind of third person player capsule uh, with a, a camera that is using Cinemachine. It's kind of fixed in world space. Uh, it's in this kind of top-down position. And the reason why I'm doing that is just to show you how to use Unity Nav Mesh um, from a third-person perspective um, so that if you didn't want to use the uh, first-person player uh, capsule or the first-person uh, player starter assets, uh, that you could have um, some capability of being able to do that. So I'm going to run through that first, and then I'll show you how the AI works. Um, but just to show you really briefly, uh, kind of proof of concept, um, going to enter play mode here and I will kind of increase the size here and I'm left clicking on the terrain which has a unity uh, which has a nav mesh attached to it and when I get within a certain distance of the uh, enemy they will start following me and then if I I've specifically made my player character faster than my enemy so that when I kind of get outside of the radius or, or the kind of chase radius, I guess you could say, of my AI, um, they stop following me and they go back into that NPC loop that we had designed previously. So um, again, I'll kind of walk through these steps and show you the code that I had made to um, program this, um, but just to give you kind of a preview of what we're looking at. Okay, so the first thing is to look at the player and this kind of top-down camera. So uh, for those of you that weren't in Game Design 1, uh, we're using Cinemachine here, and Cinemachine is a very handy plugin for doing camera tracking and camera movement. Uh, and just to kind of show you how this is working, this is the component, the Cinemachine Virtual Brain. Uh, if you had loaded in your scene a player capsule using the tools, starter assets, reset first person controller, um, you'll already have Cinemachine loaded into your project. So I have this top-down camera. It's uh, just a empty game object that has a Cinemachine virtual camera component attached to it. Um, I've modified my kind of body and aim constraints here to make it follow the player. And probably most notably, or most importantly, the binding mode of my body is set to world space. If you don't have this to set to world space and you just have it to lock to target on a sign, you're going to get this really unfortunate and funky thing where as the player moves and rotates in space, the camera will also do that and um, it will kind of mess things up a little bit. Um, so just as a word of caution, you know, try to avoid uh, using... Uh, this kind of lock on target or any of these kind of lock on target uh, things. Uh, it seems to me that world space is the most consistent. Um, the other thing that I would say too is just to make sure that you have your follow and your look at uh, components here or variables, I should say, uh, to be set to the, a new player object, uh, which I'll get into in just one second. Um, so those are the kind of important things about how I did this. I just positioned this however I thought, you know, kind of looked best in the scene, but I'll leave that up to your own discretion to figure out how you want your camera to, you know, kind of represent um, this kind of locked in place third person perspective. Um, now the player asset that I created for this is, you know, kind of emulating the first person capsule that we had been using. Um, I just uh, went to component or excuse me, game object, 3D object, and created a capsule. 
And then all I did here is that I actually removed the mesh collider um, and any rigid body that gets added here. And then I added a nav mesh agent component that we're using from the uh, nav mesh experimental packages that we were using previously. Uh, just as a reminder, if you go to window, package manager, and I was just making sure that I had Cinema Machine loaded in. This is an AI navigation, right? You just wanna make sure that you have this loaded in. Uh, I'll post a link uh, to the notes for this in, in case you need to know where that is uh, and the instructions to do that. But this player, uh, again, is just a capsule game object that has the nav mesh agent component attached to it. You'll note here that I really don't have much, I didn't change much here uh, in the kind of default settings. The only thing that I did change is the default speed, again, to make this speed higher than the speed of my NPC. So if you look at the NPC nav mesh agent and the speed variable here, that's set to 1.5, and my player is set to four, again, to allow my player to kind of run outside of the radius of my NPC so that, you know, the NPC goes back to its normal cycle. Uh, you'll also notice here that I have this, you know, just really lightweight um, component here, the script, a custom script that I've made that's called main player nav mesh. Uh, again, this is going to be very, very simple uh, script for us to be able to utilize the nav mesh uh, on our train. Um, and the last thing that I'm going to note here while uh, I'm kind of in the interface here before we look at the programming is that I uh, rebaked my nav mesh to be on the entirety of my terrain. So my terrain is is the is the object that's holding my nav mesh. So if you're wondering, you know, how this our NPC character is able to walk around and then kind of go from go away from the stage object that we had made previously. It's because I got rid of all of that stuff. I got rid of the walls that we had made before, and I had rebaked the terrain, excuse me, rebaked the nav mesh to fit the terrain. So the NPC still walks kind of within this designated cycle of destinations that we've given it previously, uh, but now it can break out of those destinations and you know walk across the rest of the nav mesh. Uh, this nav mesh also is going to be the nav mesh that the player is using, so um, this nav mesh will be will show us how we can kind of get to different places as we click around all right so hopping over to the code i'll go ahead and click on my player and i'll open up the script hopping over to the code i'm not going to kind of retype um, all of the different uh, scripting that i did here because i think and i hope that we're at a point where uh, just kind of reading some of this thing or some of this uh, code might be more valuable for you. So I'll just kind of leave this up on the screen as I'm talking through it. Um, two important things to note, uh, you'll see that I'm using unityengine.ai and I'm also using unityengine.input system to make sure that I'm able to use the nav mesh agent and all of the uh, data types that are necessary for using nav mesh. And then also that I'm able to get the mouse position for the input system. Uh, again, if you're not using the input system, that might be different for you, but we've been using the input system uh, as a result of the first person controller. So you're probably gonna wanna make sure that you're integrating that up here. Okay, uh, the only variable that I have is this nav mesh agent main player, and I'm setting that right in the start uh, by getting the component of the nav mesh agent that the script is attached to. So uh, as a result, what I'm doing, and I'll kind of just scroll down here to refocus, is that I'm asking in update if the mouse that I'm using, that's the current mouse, if the left button is being pressed, uh, that's just the left mouse button, if that's being pressed, then I'm gonna check to see uh, if a ray cast has happened. So I'm creating uh, a ray cast and I'm asking the camera main screen point array mount current position read value. Again, this should be pretty familiar to y'all uh, based upon the ray casting things that we've done previously. If you have any questions about that, feel free to ask me. Um, but I'm just making a, a simple variable here of casting array and then asking uh, the hit um, or designating a hit location once that ray is cast. And I'm creating a physics check here of ray casting my ray. And if you know it is hitting something to designate that out hit, you know, and to load the information from that ray into the ray cast hit variable that I've created. And then I'm taking that main player nav mesh agent that I've made up here or that I've kind of 
you know, designated up here. And I'm just very simply saying set destination to hit dot point. So again, getting the information of where the raycast hit and then designating the point of where it is, which is a vector three. And I'm setting the destination of my main player to that vector three. So um, I'll just go ahead and leave this up for one more second here. Uh, but what this is doing is that as I click uh, my left mouse clicker, uh, or my left mouse button rather, uh, onto areas of the nav mesh or onto the screen, uh, it will check to see if that's uh, hit something. And then it will kind of say, tell the player to use the nav mesh uh, to move the object that this is script is attached to, to that location. So if I go back over to Unity, and I made sure that this uh, script has been attached to my new player object, which it is. Again, this is not loaded yet, but when I click play in the start function, the nav mesh agent component gets loaded into that variable. And then as I click, right, my player goes to different places. Now you'll see where you try to click in areas where, right, the nav mesh is not evident and we'll kind of see if we can get the uh, terrain here to, here we go. So if I try to click in areas that are not highlighted by the nav mesh, right, my character isn't gonna know, right, where to go there. So it's not gonna move. But if I try to kind of navigate around, uh, the nav mesh will try to calculate the, the quickest path to that location. So if you are testing this out and you're clicking around, you might be kind of clicking in quote unquote dead zones where your nav mesh is not calculating and again, if you want to make sure that those areas are areas that you can actually traverse, then I would say go into your agents tab and to think about how you can modify some of the settings of your agent to make this more traversable. Again, that's going to be depending on the terrain that you're using. Okay, cool. So again, as I'm just left clicking around, it's setting the destination of that player, right? And it's moving the transform of that player to that destination. Great. Now, for the uh, NPC slash enemy AI, um, I kind of, for lack of a better term, cannibalized the uh, NPC script that we had already made in uh, class, this NPC nav mesh script. So let's go ahead and open that up. And what I did is actually I got rid of the can talk functionality and checking to see if the collision was happening and all of those uh, different things to see if you know, to stop the NPC from going through their walk cycle. Um, I got rid of the text mesh pro stuff, even though it's still loaded here. Um, I got rid of all that stuff because I, I don't actually need it. Um, I'm not talking to this NPC anymore. This NPC is now attacking me. So um, I, I've kind of modified and changed a little bit of this script because I, I figured it would be a little bit more time saving for us to modify it, something existing that we've used as opposed to writing something from scratch. So again, if you have any questions about that, feel free to let me know. But uh, the most notable things that you'll see here is that I've added a Boolean of can attack, and I've also added a float value that's called look radius. This look radius is not only uh, we're going to be checking to see if the character is within a look radius by checking a distance between the um, um, player and the NPC, uh, but we're also going to use this look, look radius to draw a kind of visual representation of how uh, wide or how far, I guess you could say, um, this character or this NPC, this enemy, is able to look. So I'm going to actually scroll down one second before showing how I kind of modified the update here. And I made this new, uh, I used this default uh, script here, or excuse me, this default function um, within Unity that's called on draw gizmos selected. And what this does is that uh, in Unity, we have gizmos, right? We already see gizmos like highlighted, you know, uh, the uh, move information or the scale information if we're doing rotation and scale, so on and so forth. Those are all gizmos. Uh, this kind of bright red camera icon, if I focus on this and zoom in, uh, this bright red camera icon for Cinemachine is a gizmo, right? Um, the gizmo of the field of view of the camera, right? That's also a gizmo. So those things, um, and if I look at my NPC, um, right, the collision, the box collider on this is a gizmo. So that is being uh, viewed when this object is selected. 
So, so I'm using a, a, a command here that's called on draw gizmo selected, which says when this object is selected, draw a new type of gizmo. I'm going to give that gizmo a color, and which is just a default red. And I'm going to say draw a wire sphere or draw like a sphere like mesh in wireframe and use the basis of that sphere to be the transform position of this and to make the radius of that sphere or the size of that sphere. Um, you can actually see the tooltip there float center and then float radius uh, to be the look radius that we've assigned at the top of our script, this float value of look radius. So now that we've uh, drawn that, if we go back into Unity and I select my NPC, and I'll focus my camera on them, you'll see a kind of bubble or a sphere being drawn around that character that's showing us uh, that look radius amount. So, you know, this is kind of, you can kind of say that this is almost like a collider without using any of the collider functionality that we have on our object, right? that's being drawn in the, sh in the scene to show us how far, quote unquote, this NPC is looking. So that's really handy, something that we haven't looked at before and something that I thought I would kind of introduce um, just to give us a sense of you know, being able to do a little bit of debugging and understand how these things are interacting with one another. So, so going back to the code, again, I kind of modified the existing update function where I created a temporary value of distance, which is a vector three measuring the distance between the main character's transform position and the transform position of this object or the object that the script is attached to, the NPC. And I'm asking if the distance is smaller than, right? Uh, smaller than the look radius, right? That amount that we did here. And I, I set this to 7.0. Uh, you might want to tweak this a little bit and see what makes sense for you. Um, you can also debug that in Unity itself. And I said if the look if the distance is smaller than the look distance, then uh, the NPC can attack. Uh, and then I asked if you can attack, then NPC or the agent, right? This agent, nav mesh agent that we designated at the beginning, set the destination to be basically following the transform position of our main character. And then I said, if the distance, you know, is greater than the look radius, then set can attack to false. And then I kind of modified our set destination loop that we had here uh, so that I said, if set destination, you know, is false and can attack is equal to false because we're not saying the opposite of in this instance, we're checking to see its state. We're saying if can attack is equal to false, then set destination, go through the set destination loop, right? If destination set and uh, can attack is also false, then you know kind of go to the next position, so on and so forth. So this is how I kind of modify this. And the way that I built this ensures that if I walk outside of the look radius, that our NPC will go back to this kind of walk cycle loop that we had previously, right? This kind of randomization of, you know, going between these different destinations that we fed into it, right, using our destination list. So uh, I'll leave this up here a little bit longer just to kind of give you time to be able to look at this update function. Um, the update starts just right above this float distance. But again, what I'm doing here is just uh, creating a temporary variable of checking the distance between the main character and our NPC. If that distance is below a certain threshold that we've made called look radius, then the AI or the NPC can start attacking. If that's the case, then the NPC's destination is now following the main character, right? And if the distance is greater than, then set the can attack to false and go back into the loop right, or the kind of, I guess you can kind of say patrolling, quote unquote, um, loop that we had designated earlier, right, where the NPC is just cycling between the different destinations that we had given it previously. I'm going to go back over to Unity, and I'm going to make sure that a couple of things. One thing that I want to make sure that I've done is that I've reset my main character variable Previously, in our previous example, we still had the main character set to the player capsule. That no longer is obviously the case since we've uh, remade a new player object that we want to measure the distance to. So make sure that you've set the main character to be that new player. Again, you can kind of think about how you want to tweak your radius here, 
Um, again, I found that seven was a pretty accurate number. Um, and then you can kind of, while we're in play mode, we can see when can attack is set to true and how the destination starts to follow our character. So I'll just kind of come over here, right? And now, right, my enemy is following my character. And if I go outside of that radius, right, it goes back to it's kind of uh, patrolling right state where now it's going back between those different destinations that we've loaded in in this list. Again, as a reminder, I made sure that this NPC is going to be using the same nav mesh as the player. Um, so again, going to navigation, you can see that the right NPC is using the nav mesh, the same nav mesh as the player. Okay, cool. So again, that's a very quick rundown of how we've modified our NPC to, you know, kind of pursue the player based upon a set radius or distance. Um, we can go ahead and reintegrate things like obstacles and things like that to kind of make this a little bit more interesting or a little bit more challenging. Um, you can obviously think about how you could, you know, do some level of interaction so that the um, uh, the main character is attacking the enemy or the enemy is attacking the main character, um, but I'm gonna leave that functionality up to you and up to your discretion. Uh, again, you can also just have it so that the main PC, you know, uh, walks up to the player to engage them, right? It doesn't have to be uh, an, a kind of uh, a violent interaction. It could be a more passive one where, you know, the NPC notices the character within a certain radius and says, oh, hey, I wanna talk to you. Um, okay, I think that that's going to do it for now. Uh, hopefully this has been an informative continuation of what we've been looking at in class, and I'm looking forward to seeing how you might implement some of these strategies into your own projects. Cool. Talk to you next week. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.